Ladies and gentlemen, the session is about to begin. Please take your seats. Could everyone be seated and start turning off everything that beeps and honks? Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Deborah Sagner, and I'm the chair of the board of the J Street Education Fund. <laughs> it is my honor and privilege to welcome you to the J Street Conference, and in particular, to this morning's plenary session. This past year, there has been no shortage of discussion within Israeli society and politics. Topics of debate have ranged from last summer's social protest movement, the Palestinian prisoner release in exchange for the kidnapped soldier, to the defensibility of the 67 lines with land swaps, and how to deal with the threat of nuclear Iran. Israeli politicians, pundits, students, and everyone in between have voiced their opinions. This morning, we will explore a wide spectrum of the current events and issues affecting Israel's economy, democracy, and security. And we will hear about each of our distinguished panelists' perspectives on the urgency of reaching an agreement to end the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I'm now going to introduce each of our panelists. Member of Knesset, Professor Avishai Braverman of Israel, Israel's Labor Party, was elected to serve in the Knesset in 2006 and was Minister of Minority Affairs from March 2009 until January 2011. Trained as an economist, and he just told me he's the only economist in the Knesset, um, M.K. Braverman has a Ph.D. from Stanford and is a former senior official at the World Bank where he focused on economic, economic development with a focus on social justice. M.K. Professor Braverman served as president of Ben-Gurion University in the Negev from 1990 to 2006. Member of Knesset Zahava Golon was recently elected chairwoman for Israel's Moretz Party. She, she entered the Knesset in 1999, where she established the Committee for the Struggle Against Trafficking of Women. She also served. She also served on the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee and the Law and Justice Committee. 
MK Cologne is a recipient of multiple awards recognizing her work on gender equality and women's rights. <laughs> MK Galon is, is among the founders of Israeli human rights group B'Tselem. <laughs> member of Knesset, Ralib Majadra, is a member of the Knesset for the Israel Labor Party and a deputy speaker of the Knesset. A member of Knesset since 2004, M.K. Majadla was appointed Minister Without Portfolio in January 2007, becoming Israel's first Arab government minister. In March 2007, he was appointed Minister of Science, Culture, and Sports, serving until March 2009. Major General Amran Mitzna joined the IDF in 1963 and served in the 1967, 73, and Lebanon wars in the Armored Corps. He was wounded twice and was awarded two medals of distinguished service. In November 1993, Mitzna was elected mayor of Haifa. Mitzna was elected party chairman for labor in 2002 and then served in the 16th Knesset. Lastly, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Arad Nir. Arad Nir is head of the Foreign News Desk and chief international commentator for Channel 2 News in Israel. In addition to many of his high-profile interviews and columns in Globes, Nir was the editor for Global Agenda, a daily international news magazine. He has also produced and directed many documentary features on global events. I turn the floor over to you, Anir. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you for your warm opening. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here and uh, moderate this session uh, of esteemed guests. So esteemed Israeli politicians that you've seen how hesitant they were when we asked them to stand up to your applause. We are not used to this kind of respect in our country. <laughs> As, uh, as you know, usually, uh, at least I was brought up on that legend, uh, when you put four Jews in one room, you get ten different opinions. <laughs> Bearing in mind the uh, perception of uh, J Street amongst uh, Israeli politicians, especially from the center to the right, I have a feeling that uh, this afternoon we'll get four different opinions, and even that is only because our friend Ghaleb Bajadla is a Muslim. Mm -hmm. uh, we are about to uh, begin, and uh, the session will go as uh, I'll ask uh, each and every one of uh, our guests here to come up to the podium and give uh, opening remarks, and uh, then we'll have a discussion back down on the stage. A uh, professor, member of Knesset, uh, Avishai Braverman, please begin your presentation on correcting Israel's past toward fair economy and just society. We are anxious to hear. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Arad, my distinguished colleagues, friends. No, 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 Fine. Thank you, my distinguished colleagues, friends. I am thrilled to be here with all the young students here. I am experiencing again my life as president of Ben Gurion University. Uh, power to you and to the older ones, because again, the energy level here is exciting, and I think it's very meaningful. Thank you. I am 64. I was born January 15, 1948. So if you know history, I'm four months Palestinian. I was born during British Palestine, and the rest Israeli. 
I am proud to be an Israeli. My parents came in 36 and 38. I lost five of my uncles, three of my grandparents in the Holocaust. And we really build a very impressive country. And indeed, we can sing the praises. And yesterday we heard we're so creative. We're leading the world in startups. We have such incredible culture. In spite of all, we created strong army and impressive economy. However, if we only look at the half full glass and forget the half empty glass, we are in a danger that this great accomplishment can go to a very dangerous path which will threaten, which will threaten our survival. Therefore, I want to come back to the purpose of Zionism. And I say that my good friend Raleb, as a Jew, what is the question of Zionism? Ben Gurion went to the prophet, borrowed this concept from Isaiah and Amos, and after the Holocaust, yes, we wanted in Israel to create a place for the Jews. That will be sustainable, but that will be Hevrat Mofet, a light unto the nation. And the question today is how six million Jews to be seven, eight, even nine are sustainable proposition among billion and a half Muslims, 350 million Arabs, in a world of India and China and Russian Tsar when America is some on the decline, and where 30 years from now, 70% of the children in school in Israel are either Jewish, Jewish ultra-Orthodox or Arab Muslims. And where today we have to make decision, do we want to fulfill the prophecy of Ben-Gurion and the prophet, or to disperse into canton like states? And I think we have an option, and I'll start on one word on the partition of the Holy Land, but I'll come to the key economics, the economic of justice that is missing in your land, but is also missing in our land. One thing, I want to make things, as one president said in Washington, perfectly clear. I'm not a distinguished general like my friend, General Mitzna. I was only lieutenant in the army, but when in 1967, I finished my platoon commander course in the desert and was sent after the war to Gaza. <clears throat> ben Gurion, our greatest leader, appeared on the radio and said, we have to return back the West Bank and Gaza. <clears throat> All the generals at the time, Moshe Dayan and the rest, laughed at this old man. They say he was senile, we have 100 years of empire. Six years was 73. Ben Gurion and Eshkol, Wanted to do so, we made a mistake. You cannot go back in time, but it's clear today that we have to partition the Holy Land as soon as possible, because otherwise, and you heard that, we'll have one nation west of the Jordan River, who is majority Arab, or we won't allow rights for the Arab, both propositions are unacceptable. Therefore, your pass, our pass, the security of Israel and survival, the pro-Israeli position is partition of the Holy Land for the sake of the Jews. <laughs> but I want to go to economics. The Prime Minister and the Finance Minister are saying that our economy is the best in the world. Yes, our GNP per capita is impressing. Yes, our inflation is low. Yes, the ratio of debt to GNP is satisfactory and nice. And our unemployment rate is only 5%. But this is not only economics. I give an example. When I played basketball, when I was 20 years old, people asked me, brother man, can you describe yourself? I say 6'2 and 90 kilo, uh, 78 kilograms. Today, when I describe myself, I say 6'2", 90 kilograms. However, my blood pressure is 130 and 80 with pills. I have problem with the cholesterol. No, cholesterol is fine, but prostate I have to check. 
Economy is not only that, and Israel today is the most unequal society in the Western world, with the exception of you. We're competing. But when you look at the prices in Miami, in Washington, in New York, compared to Tel Aviv, Be'er Sheva, or Jerusalem, our purchasing power is so much lower. So we are beating even you. Second, our education level, when I grew up, we've been first in the world in mathematics. Today, in the best students, we are the lowest in the Western world. I don't speak about average students that are in the third world. The Arabs, students, statistically speaking, are the among the lowest in the third world. And the Haredi don't study at all the basics of English, mathematics, and the rest. Third, we talk about unemployment. But our participation rate in the labor force is the lowest in the developing countries because the ultra-Orthodox male don't work and we make constraint of some of the Arab population. Therefore, I want to outline in bullets of 30 seconds each what should be economic of justice that I oppose Netanyahu. Netanyahu learned from the Republican right the theory of trickle-down theory, which you cut taxes to the rich and the filter down to the rest of the society. It never happened in any country in the world, and I'm an economist, and it doesn't happen in Israel. <laughs> Point number one, the ultra-Orthodox. Ben-Gurion released 400 yeshiva bocher from going to the army and for work. Yes, until Begin came to power in 75, the participation rate in the labor force of Orthodox Jewish male was 75%, like secular males, like Arab males. Today, it's 40%. This is heresy. Maimonides, the great light, say that if you don't work because you are not forced not to work, you have no place in Gan Eden in afterlife. It's a mistake of all the coalition from Begin until today. The ultra orthodox have to go to work, and immediately, because otherwise, not only the secular and the rest of us won't carry them, they will be destroyed. And the time has come, and the time is now. <laughs> when it comes to the Arab population, and I was Minister of Minorities, Rabin was the only leader that gave the Arab population in Israel respect. They gave them also resources, and my good friend Ralebs was with him, and I was in the university with him, and the outcome was tremendous support of the Arab population. We didn't do much. I tried as a minister to move in that direction, but then unfortunately Netanyahu listened to Lieberman, and here we have the Arab population that is a source not only for equality, for human point of view, or security point of view. The economic growth of Israel is calling for the participation of the Arab labor and the ultra orthodox labor, and it has to be changed, and they have to be changed now. It's important, and it has to be done. Third, <laughs> education. You know, I served in Washington during Ronald Reagan, that, by the way, Ronald Reagan was the most Keynesian president. He expanded the budget more than President Obama. You should know that about that. And Ronald Reagan said, policy is personnel. And our education system has to be changed. We have to increase the salary of teachers, give the best now teachers and headmasters, let for early retirement thousands of teachers that are inept, obsolete, and become again what we are, Jewish state, where there is power to education, and not only to manipulators of banks or brokers of illusions. <laughs> and here I come towards the main issue, how we reform our system. We have defunct political system. We, don't, we in this country, we have the best and the brightest and the most moral. They don't arrive in politics. My young son, I have a young son in high school. And he came to me last year and he said, Father, why are you in politics? Politics, by the way, is the most despised position in Israel. Even last week it came. He said, you shaming me and the family. Go back and do something else. 
and I told him the only reason I'm in politics is because of you. Ah, you know, I'm 64, I have many years to do, but I can do many other things. If we don't change the course, the way you, you say in J Street, the way you say in Israel, for justice and changing policies, you'll join your two aunts, my sister and my wife's sister are 30 years in LA. Therefore, the time for action is now to change our political system that is defunct. <coughs> we have to create a system in which our primary system has to be reformed so that young people that are in the social protest, that serious people with experience, not only machers, come at the time that is the most complicated maybe in human history and in Israel and serve the nation. We need again to create a serving elite that is so much missing today at the top of Israel. And here I come to my conclusion. Why I am optimistic? I am optimistic for three reasons. One, my mother, people talked yesterday here about mothers, so I'll have to say something about that. <laughs> my mother, Sarah, was a kindergarten teacher, and she taught me, always be optimistic, otherwise you'll get ulcer or depression, so it's better to be optimistic. <laughs> Second, I walk all over the world in the four continent. I never met in my life, like in Israel, young people and mature people that are moral, that are courageous, that are smart, and this group that doesn't filter to the top of big business, to the top of politics, to the top of the sports team, because of the social protest, there is a new consciousness. And therefore, I believe that the change is coming, and Al Samit, who is my greatest mentor in life, the greatest Jewish teacher in my book, Rabbi Hillel. My mentor in economics is Rabbi Hillel that have three principles. Imei nani li mini, uchshani la atzmi maani, vim lo achshav ematai. If I'm not for myself, who is for me? Private enterprises, business, responsibility, even that things look like they are hopeless. But then, if I'm only for myself, who am I? If there is no family, there is no country, there's no people, there is no planet. It's only me and me and my money and my greed and my power. Then the world is finished. And the rule of action, if not now, then when? I believe the time has come to a major change. Because of the social protests, because of the awareness in America and in the world, and the awareness in Israel. We are marching on a new wide road. And yes, it includes, it includes J Street, it includes you, and it includes the groups in Israel that want to have transformation and change. God bless you and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Professor Raberman, for these uh, inspiring words. And uh, I now I'd like to call upon a uh, member of Knesset, uh, Raleb Majadle, uh, who will speak about the prospects for peace between Israel and Palestinians in Israel. Uh, member of Knesset uh, Majadle will speak in Hebrew, and we will be screening uh, his speech translated to English. Shalom libae haveida shlishit shil erguna J Street. Ani mivarech et yozme meargene vetomche haveida. Yesh li akavod vazchut lishtatef bavida ulabia et et mechati anechretzet baergun J Street. כאחד מנבחרי הציבור של החברה הערבית, אני מאמין בשותפות יהודית ערבית כאופציה מועדפת למאבק משותף של שני העמים על דמותה של החברה הישראלית. מאבק למען חברה דמוקרטית, שוויונית ושוחרת שלום אמת בין שני העמים. אני מאמין שסיום הסכסוך 
בין מדינתי לבין עמי ייעשה רק בדרך השלום, אשר מצד אחד מבטיח את ביטחונה ועתידה של ישראל, ומצד שני את הקמתה של המדינה הפלסטינית לצידה של ישראל. דרך ארוכה עשתה הליגה הערבית בכיוון השלום. מאז ועידת חרטום באוגוסט 68' ועידת שלושת הלאווים, לא למשא ומתן, לא להכרה ולא לשלום עם ישראל. בשנת 2008 היא קיבלה הליגה הערבית החלטה לאשרר את יוזמת השלום הערבית. הסעודית אשר נערכה בסעודיה בעיר הכי קדושה למוסלמים במדין אל-מנוורה שנחתמה בידי 22 מדינות ושמשמעותה נורמליזציה עם מדינת ישראל תמורת הקמה מדינה פלסטינית לצידה נציגי העם הפלסטיני בהסכמי אוסלו קבעו את דרך השלום כאופציה מועדפת שלהם להסדר הסכסוך. ממשלת ישראל בראשות מר אולמרט התקדמה לשלום באומץ ובנחישות עם ההנהגה הפלסטינית בראשות הנשיא מחמוד עבאס. אך בסיום כהונתה של ממשלת אולמרט קטע את הסיום המשא ומתן והגעה להסדר לצערי הרב. ממשלת ישראל בראשות מר נתניהו בהרכב הקואליציוני הנוכחי אינה מסוגלת לקיים תהליך משא ומתן אמיתי. ההתנחלויות הן מכשול לשלום ולצערנו נציגי המתנחלים ובראשם שר החוץ ליברמן מובילים את הממשלה ומסנדלים אותה עמוק. <אח> רק ממשלה אחרת עם הרכב אחר אשר מאמינה בשלום יכולה להביא להפשרת הקיבעון בתהליך המדיני ולהתחיל משא ומתן בתקווה להגיע ליעד הנכסף. <אח> רוח אופטימית חייבת לשרור בקרבנו ואסור לנו להתייאש. עלינו לנצח את יריבינו הפוליטיים מחרחרי מלחמה וחסרי תקווה. דרך השלום, הסובלנות והכבוד לאחר ולשונה היא הדרך להבטיח את עתיד ילדינו ביחד. מי היה מאמין שמלחמת מאה שנים בין צרפת לאנגליה תסתיים בשיתוף פעולה ובהבנה בין שתי המדינות עם גבולות פיתוחים ומעבר חופשי. מי יכול להעלות בדעתו שגרמניה של היטלר תהפוך לימים למדינה המחויבת לעתידה וביטחונה של ישראל, השנייה בעולם רק לארצות הברית? מדוע לאורך 500 שנות שלטון האסלאם יכלו היהודים לחיות בכבוד וכבעלי זכויות בספרד? ביטוי לכך אנו רואים בחייו ובכתוביו של הרמב״ם, אחד מגדולי מנהיגי וחכמי העם היהודי, שחי בספרד בתקופה שנחשבה בהיסטוריה לטור הזהב. כל אלו מוכיחים כי הדבר אפשרי, כי אנו יכולים לחיות יחד זה בצד זה, ולהביא לתקווה גדולה לשני העמים, ולבנות את עתידנו בכבוד ובשגשוג, וזה בידינו, ולא מעשה שמיים. צר לי לקבוע שבישראל הגזענות מרימה ראש לאחרונה נגד ערבים, 
אבל גם נגד יהודים אתיופים, וגורמת לניכור ושסעים בחברה הישראלית. הגזענות מאיימת עלינו כחברה דמוקרטית וערכית, ופוגעת במרקם היחסים בין שני העמים. הפערים החברתיים בחברה הישראלית הולכים ומתרחבים. 25% מהמשפחות בישראל, 35% מהילדים בישראל ויותר מ-53% מהמשפחות הערביות בישראל חיים תחת קו העוני. הפערים בשכר בחברה הישראלית הולכים ומתרחבים עד סכנה חברתית ממשית. הממשלה הקודמת בה כיהנתי עשתה רבות למען ההצטרפות של ישראל לארגון המדינות לשיתוף פעולה כלכלי ה-OECD והממשלה הנוכחית השלימה את מהלך ההצטרפות בתרועה רמה מאוד. חשוב לזכור שישראל מצויה עדיין בתקופת ניסיון וכי אחת המחויבויות שלה היא צמצום הפערים בין עשירים לעניים. אנו עדים לתהליך אחר כיום, וזו סיבה לדאגה וחרדה. אני שוב רוצה להודות לכם על ההזמנה להשתתף בכינוס השנתי של ה-J Street השלישי. שמחתי להיות בחברתכם, ומקווה שתרמתי תרומה צנועה לפעילותכם <coughs> החשובה. שלום לכם ולהתראות. Well done. Thank you, Aleb. I'm proud uh, to call upon uh, Zahava Galon, member of Neset, who will uh, talk to us about the demo Israeli democracy and the threats it faces. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I am moved and excited to be speaking to you for the first time. This great assembly is clear evidence that there is a need for a different voice, a humanistic, liberal, and progressive voice in the Jewish community in the United States and in Israel. Friends, two months ago, I was elected to be the head of Meret, the social democratic left-wing human rights and peace party in Israel. Thank you. Meret was the first Zionist party to raise the flag for two-state solution and advanced it in many years before it became a consensus. But today, I want to talk about the anti-democratic campaign that is presently taking place in Israel. And that's why I believe that this conference is taking place at a critical time. The struggle that is currently taking place over Israel's character is no longer being waged between the right wing and the left wing or even between supporters of Great Israel versus supporters of Land for Peace. Today, the struggle in Israel is being engaged between a camp that is committed to democracy and the anti-democracy camp that is willing to sacrifice Israel on the altar of a messianic vision. We are fighting against those who are prepared to sacrifice the ideas of universal entitlement of human <coughs> rights and of justice for the purpose of controlling the territories through the oppression and occupation of millions of Palestinians. They are willing to do so at the cost of the losing at the state of Israel's democratic character. The reality imposed by Israel in the occupied territories, controlled by Israel for over 40 years, has diffused through the Green Line into the state of Israel. 
oppressing millions of people for such a long period of time is first of all abusive towards the Palestinians, but it also gradually erodes the democratic system in Israel. Because of the occupation, we maintain separate legal system for different ethnicities in the territories. Those who think a country can create these practices and not having them affect its regular legal system are delusional. The occupation promotes flawed and unacceptable moral standards that legitimize racism, persecution, and lawlessness. Friends, let us then call it like it is. It is the occupation that undermines Israeli democracy. It is the occupation that led Israel to diplomatic isolation. It is the occupation that hampers Israel's economic growth and development. The masses of Israelis who took to the streets during last summer's social protest wanted to restore the lost welfare state that Israel took pride in. The reality is that Israel does support a welfare state, but it is a settler welfare state, and our tax money is supporting the settlement and the occupation regime more and more. <laughs> I want to share with you my personal experience as a member of the current Knesset and to talk about how the effects of the occupation are being manifested in the Knesset, the Israeli parliament. Those who find it legitimate to persecute Palestinians and to deny them of their basic rights now find it acceptable to do the same to Israel's Arab citizens. They now see no problem in persecuting civil rights organizations and anyone in the Israeli left simply because they oppose the government. I am sure that you have read about the law prohibiting the boycott of settlement products, about the McCarthy law likes denying funding from human rights NGOs, about the appalling attempts to undermine the authority of the Supreme Court, and about the attempts to limit freedom of, of the press. All these were laws that were enacted during the current Knesset in the, time, in the time frame of, let's say, in the last uh, two years, about two years. Today in Israel, it is a government that has no problem passing laws whose purpose is the silencing of the critical voices and protests. It is the government obsessed with del delegitimizing the political opposition and this government, which has trampled on the basic democratic rules of the game, is now moving from for, for persecuting the opposition to undermining the democratic process as a whole. These attempts to change the democratic rules of the game meant to serve the party in power, stem from unwillingness to come to terms with the shattered vision of greater Israel. So what now? I believe that democracy and equal rights cannot coexist with the occupation of another people. I believe that we need to talk about ourselves, our struggle for democracy, and the character of the state of Israel. I believe that in Israel, we still have a strong democratic base. We have a foundation of protected basic rights and an active legal system and civil society. And I believe that the recent anti-democratic epidemic will stimulate the immune system of the state of Israel and that the democratic antibodies will now fight back and restore justice and basic freedoms. I see Meret spearheading this struggle. We are fighting to block those government initiatives and we are obli obligated to protecting democracy and to restoring a moral and just Israel. <coughs> 
friends, in this struggle, J Street and its supporters are our key partners. You are the two friends of Israel. You must allow the fair right, the dangerous ultra-conservative elements in the United States and in Israel to rubber stamp a process that is a strategic danger to Israel's very existence. Israel's far right, the current Israeli government, all those for whom the land of Israel is more important than the state of Israel, they want blind loyalty without criticism. But a true friend must tell the truth. Continuing the occupation endangers our existence and distorts our moral character. A true friend must say, Israel must remain democratic. Friends, we need you on our side in this struggle. We need your voice, our voice, to be heard out loud. History is being made right now. Now is the time to act. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Zahava. Uh -huh. And uh, as a real military man, uh, Amra Mitzna is on the podium now, and he'll <laughs> talk about Israel's security challenges and the urgent need for peace. Please, member of Knesset. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to share with you news from Jerusalem, if you didn't hear. Uh, the Supreme Court, as a court of justice, rejected the compromise of evacuation of the Migron settlement. <laughs> and as uh, Prime Minister Begin said many years ago, there are judges in Jerusalem. And I think that the Supreme Court is the gardening wall of Israel democracy, and we should praise for them to be successful as they were in the past. So this is very good news. I am very privileged to be here with you today in this uh, annual convention. I wish J Street organization was invented many, many years ago. We were waiting for such an organization. <laughs> to take role and to show that there is not only one approach to be pro-Israeli. And we are all Israelis responsible for our country. And we wish that such an organization, J Street, will increase its members. And I must admit that it is very touching to see so many youth and young adults. I don't believe. <laughs> I don't believe that there is any other Jewish organization that succeed to generate, to attract so many youth Young. to the Israeli cause. And it, this is wonderful. And I'm saluting to you, J Street staff and members and organization for succeeding so much. Now, it is unbelievable that in the period that we live, Nobody is talking about peace. There is no peace camp in Israel. There is no party in Israel that is running from the prime minister as an alternative to Netanyahu that use the flag of arrangements, agreements with our neighbors, with the Palestinians. It is unbelievable that the government do not and 
doing nothing with trying to promote and to go back to the negotiation table in order to reach an agreement between us and the Palestinians. I want to say, uh, maybe this is the bottom line of, of my, uh, my speech, is that the, continuous, the continuation of occupation is extremely risky for the State of Israel. And I'm speaking from a security point of view. I would like to take you to understand that the vital interest of the State of Israel is to finish the occupation. From a military point of view, from the fence point of view, it is an interest not just because we are more right than the Palestinians. It is very important not just because we were wrong for so many years and what we have done to the Palestinians. This is not the question. This is not the question also whether we are returning territories since 67 under our occupation. It is an interest of the State of Israel. And I'm speaking only from this point of view. And the real question for the future is how can we guarantee the ability, the capability, the future capability of the State of Israel to protect its citizens, to keep its independence, and to be a Jewish, a democratic state. There are a lot of threats around us. Terror by non-state non organizations, terror by states around Israel, terror by states very far away from Israel. Of course, the uh, threat of launching missiles, rockets, from Gaza Strip, from uh, southern Lebanon, and of course from Iran. But also a threat of delegitimizing the state of Israel in the free world. Pressure, boycotting the State of Israel, and I don't have to tell you that it is an issue today here in the United States, in main universities and colleges, and all over the world. I'm suspecting that we will face in the future conflict with the United States. Coordination, maybe reassessment as we experienced in the past, and this is a threat to the possibility to defend the State of Israel. And of course, the absence of national consensus inside Israel about what we should do. Most Israelis, as it was said already yesterday, do believe that we have to separate ourselves from the Palestinians. But most of those Israelis don't believe that there is a politician leadership that is ready and able to do it in the future. So what is the response to these uh, threats? Well, first of all, I want to touch the issue of defensible uh, uh, borders. I want to remind everybody that in 67, we gained the most, the greatest victory from what then Abba Evan called Auschwitz borders. And it was the biggest and the greatest victory ever, the Six Day War. Only six years later, from the borders of 73, which were the most defendable borders that you can imagine. We were standing against attack from two or three fronts, and the survivance of Israel was on stake. So what I want to say is that today there is no defensible 
borders in the Middle East, the dimensions, the density in this area. We can't look for and we cannot uh, uh, see it in the future as a defensible borders. Defensible borders means recognized borders. Recognized borders by our neighbors and by the international uh, uh, world. Arrangements, security arrangements, very important uh, uh, in the future. And security arrangements means that Israel will not be under attack from the 67 borders. Now, when I'm speaking about the future negotiation with the Palestinians, it seems to me that it will not be able to achieve what the Geneva uh, Agreement was about. Uh, overall agreement is not in touch. But what we can have is a discussion, negotiation on two elements. Borders, which is so important, and as I said, security arrangements. So, so to sum up what I said, for a long term, Israel will not be able to protect it itself without agreements with our neighbors. Two-state solution is the only available solution. There is no other solutions. Those who are talking about one state for two nations are talking about Arab, another Arab country. Israel as a democracy and as a Jewish state will not survive under the idea of one state for two nations. So the only solution available is partition and it is two states for two people. As I said before, no natural borders in the Middle East. And it is a vital, vital interest for Israel that to, to reach such, such an agreement. Unfortunately, I'm not so optimistic that the current government is, has the will, has the capability and the ability to go ahead. I hope that together we can uh, look into the future and do all what is needed in order to protect the state of Israel, in order to defend our democracy, and in order to let our children and grandchildren live in a secure Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Amram. Ladies and gentlemen, please accept my profound and sincere apologies. I misled you. I promised you four different opinions. <laughs> and uh, we heard more of the same opinion with various nuances. And uh, my, questions, my, question, my, my first question to you is how do we widen the perception? We are convincing the convinced. The people in this hall agree with you, you agree with each other, but the vast majority of the people in Israel voted the other way. And uh, if election to be held soon, they'll vote the very same way again. Professor Braverman, would you like to, to start? How do we widen this perception? Thank you, Nir. First, I think there are two elements to that. A, the left and the center left in Israel is partly to blame for that as well. Because many of the people, including a development town, some of the poorer people, essentially... Hey, one minute. We hear you on the phone, we hear you on the phone when you are talking. So, it's not the Knesset here, it's not the Knesset. Please. Essentially, uh, are starting to understand that they are economically deprived, 
and they have a problem. But many of them are not very liberal, are more conservative in their views. Therefore, somehow, the approach to get them is to be broader, kinder to them, in a sense to listen to their some conservative point of view. The second thing is that I, uh, contrary to Nir, I believe the game is not over until it's over, like Yogi Berra said. <laughs> and uh, we'll have election for Kadima on Tuesday, and Netanyahu now feels is in the heights. And part of the issue is the poor leadership of the Palestinians as well. It takes two for tango. So therefore, while most Israelis really wants to go for the partition, on the other side there is a problem. What I can say, let's broaden the conversation, let's continue to work on that, let's include segments that were not in the center left, because I believe on the economic front, most people are deprived by Netanyahu policies and still vote for him. If we include and increase the conversation, I think we have a chance. It, we takes, have it takes two for tango, you yes. said, but it seems that uh, we are dancing on the floor and there are other people who seem to clean it for us all the time and we are dancing on our own and no one sees the other people. Uh, Zahava, uh, uh, we, we, we were cheering uh, 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 Stav Shafir yesterday here who had a wonderful speech. But still, the Israeli people did not go out to the streets because there are transparent people next to them. As Amos Oz said, on, we are on top of them and they are succumbed to us. The people of Israel went out to the street in vast quantities, vast numbers. We had even the equality of the number here in, in the United States because of the price of a cottage can. Isn't that spoilness? Are we, can we afford this now? Arad, it's really very frustrating, I must admit. Most of the Israelis went to the street in order to protest against the price of the cottage. Well, you know, it's more than that, it's more than that of course. But I think what's, what happened in the last few years that people in Israel, they really don't pay attention anymore of what's going on uh, behind the wall, you know, behind the wall. They didn't see Palestinians for so many years, you know. They, they got the feeling and they were convinced for many years that there is no chance, there is no partner, there is no chance to do a, a, a peace agreement with the Palestinians. And let's talk about economy, let's talk about uh, social rights. Uh, uh, leave the, the question, the big question with the Palestinians. I think it's a mistake, and I think also it was a mistake not talking about the issue with the Palestinians during the last summer. But you did not. Because there is a... But the politicians did not. Okay. So the politicians I'm... were hesitant so let me to talk... raise the issue. So let me talk on behalf of Merit, my party. I think that there is a mistake not to put the connection between the social issues and the problem, the biggest problem of Israel. There is a connection. And we... And we pay the price, you know, because... A, a, as I talk, you know, there is a welfare state. It's in the settlements. You should go to the settlements and to see their houses. We are paying millions of millions of millions of dollars in order to, uh, how do you say, in order to maintain, to maintain, to maintain the settlements, in order to maintain the occupation. So there is a price, and the price is the, the cost of the... Of the the, the, cost, rent, uh, the, the rent, rent of the apartments. of the apartments, the price of the cottage. So we are paying the price, and those leaders that they are trying to divide or to make a distinction between the social situation and the uh, diplomatic situation and the situation of the Palestinians, they are cheating the Israeli. Uh, 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 Raleb, do, do, you, do you do you get the translation? So my question to you is. What should the Palestinians do in order to change the equation? Okay, we understand now that uh, we have to explain to the Israeli people, but what should the Palestinians do in order to become apparent and not transparent? Should they refer to violence again? Evan Toti? No, I'll tell you in Hebrew. 
I'll ask it in, 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 uh, in, in Hebrew again. השאלה שלי הייתה, מה הפלסטינים צריכים לעשות כדי לחזור לשיח הציבורי הישראלי? האם לשוב לאלימות? האלימות היא הדרך הפסולה ביותר. אין זולת דרך השלום והמשא ומתן. Violence is the most despised way. The peace and, and, and negotiation is the only way. הנשיא עבאס החליף את החליפה הצבאית של ערפאת בחליפה ובעניבה דיפלומטית. פרזידנט עבאס השתמש את ערפאת מיליטרי סוט עם דיפלומטי סוט. עם טאי וג'קט. הפלסטינים הגיעו להכרה והפנימו את המציאות. פלסטינים הגיעו להכרה והפנימו את המציאות. וזה מוכח ממחכוני המחקר שלהם. And it is being proved by their uh, uh, researches. Yes, Rov, the halicha, the opcia, the shalom, the kerev of the Palestinians. There is majority for peace within the Palestinian people. Amra Mitzna, do you agree to that? I fully agree to what was said uh, with my colleagues. Uh, I said already that I'm not so optimistic because I don't see any alternative, evolving alternative, political alternative in Israel to Benjamin Netanyahu. What we should do is, first of all, as Ava said, uh, let people understand the connection between security and secure the country and the social issues. The government you must willing? raise two flags. One of them is security arrangements, policy with our neighbors, and the other one is social security. If I would have been rude, I would have said that maybe this is why you were not elected to, to, to lead the Labour <laughs> Party now, because this is not electability. That's right, therefore I'm not so optimistic, as I said in the beginning. <laughs> But I, th- I think that in Israel today, there are many movements of youth and young adults that are taking responsibility. And you know, there are some movements that encourage their followers to sign to a party, to be party members, because most Israelis are not members in parties. To be a member of a party, to influence parties from the inside, it's very important. Secondly, I think that the uh, U.S. policy, probably after the current elections, the coming elections, is very important. And I hope that President Obama after being elected in November. This has to be... Will put his hands on the issue. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that we can do it alone. We have to have our allies, those who are supporting the Israeli issue, to be, and to be a force in this arena in order to push sides to negotiate and to reach an agreement. There is some sense of discontent next to me. Avishai, please. I'll tell you, uh, I uh, think if we wait for American president to force a solution, we have to work for, wait for the Messiah because I don't see, even if President Obama is elected, Again, it's we have to do that. And my hope about change is the following. It's basically the, if you define in the polls today the center left and the right, we are lacking the difference maybe between 18 and 20 seats. So essentially 10 seats from one side to the other will change. How can we win the election, the center left? By higher participation rate, as General Minchna intended. If the people that came to the street, you know, a seat in the parliament is about 33 near 35,000 people. So basically, 
If many of the people, the young people that don't vote, they'll give seven seats to Kadima, to Avoda, to Meretz, etc. And then Raleb. The Arabs' participation rate is very low, 50%. If they increase it to 60 some percent and vote for Arab Party, for Labour, for Meretz, Kadima, you can have 12 seats and that will change the, the election and Netanyahu will be prime minister. Easier, easier, you know, for, 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 for my media perspective, I can definitely say easier said than, than done. done. I say. Or, or that, that, that's the full part of, of the glass. The empty part of the glass is wishful thinking. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but uh, Arad, you know, um, I must admit that I don't think that we have the luxury to be depressed. So I'm, I'm optimistic, although it's very difficult. I'm optimistic and I think that... You're driving optimistically towards the wall. I'm optimistic, <laughs> Arad. You aren't going to change my, my, my beliefs. And you know, I think that in the end, uh, people will understand that you can't talk only about social justice, justice without talking about freedom. And it's connected. And if you still will say it and will say it, I don't know, it's very hard. Believe me, it's very hard not to be in the consensus and to keep talking about occupation, about uh, violations of human rights, about the need to make peace. It's very hard, you know, because, because people prefer, you know, let them, uh, the, the easiest things. But I, I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Braverman, with uh, Professor Braverman. Let me, let, let, let me just help you analyze the optimism. Just remind me, uh, in, let's say, in 92 elections, how many seats did Meretz have? Okay, we got in 92 12 seats. And how now, many okay, I'll you go have for now? It. Now we got, you know, now no, no, it was number. before I was elected. Now we got, we have only three seats in the, the Knesset. Only three. And only, if you were there, but, there were four. But, but, let me, but let me say like this. Um, I, you, you should help in English. How do you say it? It's not, it, uh, it's, it's, fate. It's not it's fate. fate. It's not fate. It's, it's can not fate. It can be changed. Uh -huh. And I believe that those supporters of the peace camp in Israel, the supporters of democracy and human rights will change the atmosphere in Israel. And that's why I'm, I'm optimistic. We are going to be there. It's not a faith. How do you say it? It's not, it's a, not fate. It's not fate. It's a Am choice of the people. Amram. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Amram, you were, you were uh, suggesting uh, that uh, President Obama might uh, help us or impose something on us. On that point, I want to uh, uh, put into the conversation an idea that uh, was raised by a member of the club. <laughs> Uh, Peter Reinhardt on an op-ed in uh, the New York Times a few, week, few days ago, and he's suggesting uh, that American Jewry should boycott settlements for all what it means. Is, may, maybe, maybe, maybe this is part of the way that people who think that things should be uh, made the other way around. Maybe this is part of the deal of how to impose a solution. Maybe if the people of Israel do, do not understand the good words, maybe they'll understand it through their pockets. What do you, what do you think about the suggestion? I'm not sure that it is uh, helpful. I don't think that uh, Jewish uh, communities in the United States will share such an opinion. There are, you know, from the right and the left, J Street, APAC, and so many So thanks God there's APAC still. And, uh, and unfortunately, I don't think that it is helpful. But the window of opportunities in the Middle East have a timetable. And time is against us, against the moderate Arab countries in the region. Le le and therefore, just a minute, let me, let me finish, uh, Arad. And therefore, I am worried, I'm scared that we are risking the state of Israel if we are not 
taking uh, our face in our hands. Okay. We, we, so we, so we, why, we, why we'll I'm get saying... There, we'll, we'll, we'll get there uh, uh, just now, but uh, at this point I want to uh, add uh, Ralem Majadla into the conversation again and ask him about this idea of boycotting settlements. Ralem, my question is about the idea להחרים התנחלויות, שיהודי ארצות הברית יחרימו התנחלויות, בשלב ראשון יהודים, אולי אחר כך גם אחרים. מה דעתך על זה? תראה, אני בעיקרון נגד החרמות. I'm against all boycotts in principle. גם אמרתי את זאת כאשר עלה הנושא נגד ישראל בכל הנושא של האקדמיה והתרבות. I've said it even in the context of boycotting Israel in the academics. אבל ההתנחלויות הן המכשול לשלום. But settlements are the obstacle for peace. ואנחנו לא יכולים לתת להם סיכוי להמשיך להתפתח ולחזק אותם. And we cannot give them a chance to keep on thriving and strengthen them. ולכן זה חרם מיוחד במינו. This is why it's a very special boycott. על דבר שאנחנו לא מקבלים אותו. והוא מכשול לשלום. On something that we do not uh, accept and which is an obstacle for peace. So, I mean, you, you sound like a real Jewish politician. Is it yes or no? אתה נשמע כמו... You actually sound like a rabbi. אתה נשמע כמו פוליטיקאי יהודי, אתה בעד או לא בעד? לא, לא, אני נשמע ברור מאוד. אני נשמע... I'm very clear, he says. אני נשמע ברור מאוד. אני נגד חרמות על החברה הישראלית כמדינה. I'm against... I'm against any boycott. Uh, uh, on Israel, uh, on Israeli society and on the Israeli state. This is a pinpointed uh, boycott against the obstacle for peace. So my interpretation is yes. Okay, Zahava, please. Um, I, I want uh, to draw a distinction between um, boycott the state of Israel that, of course, I oppose it, I'm against it, and boycott the settlement policy. And uh, I, I want to tell you something on the personal level that more than uh, two decades, more than 20 years, I boycott settlement products. When I, when I go to the super, I don't buy settlement products. On the political level, uh, I, I want to share with you that um, I put a bill that uh, remarks the, set, the products that, were, that, were, um, that they are from the settlements. And I, I think that we don't have to be so afraid, you see. And, uh, and also I can understand, I'm talking as an Israeli, not as an American. So I'm talking uh, uh, from my responsibility to the Israeli society. I think that people should know that there is a, that there is a price for ongoing the, the settlement, you know, for ongoing the occupation. People in the settlements, they should know that there is a price. Now they feel great. They have their houses, they have their money, they have the budget, and we are paying the price. And it's important to put on the table the discourse, it's not, I know people say it's not efficient, it's not going to change the situation. It might be, but putting the, the, the question of boycotting the settlements on the table, it's important in order to talk about the price that we are as an Israeli society paying for having the settlement for more than 40 years. Lisa? The path to hell is paved with great intentions. I, uh, for one, think that this is both ineffective way, and General Mitzner articulate. And second, since many of the people here are very learned, understand all the distinctions of what happened in Israel, for most people in the world, they don't understand that. So the minute you start to boycott settlement will be boycott of Israel. I saw that when I was watching Serbia, I have no idea what takes place. Therefore, for me, the policy is very clear. We should get now and have pressure and do everything we can to go to the 67 border with modification, put the pressure, fight for that. But I think this type of approach is ineffective and eventually also 
will be harming for the state of Israel. Therefore, with all the good intention, I oppose it. Talking about uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we were talking about um, Israeli politics, and uh, this weekend, before we, came, before we came in, the talk on Israeli media was that uh, Netanyahu is going to have early elections. Uh, today, he actually announced that he is not going uh, to uh, call early elections, and elections is going to be on time, which is November to 2013. No, I think, uh, yeah, the election uh, date is November 2013, but since, uh, you know, the budget won't pass, so the election will be uh, a lot closer. So you are still on, on, on Friday, <laughs> you know? No, 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 <laughs> that, no, no, that, no, that, no, no, That was, even, the, even that was the, the pretext for, 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 the, for the discussion. It, it, it might be earlier, but no. nonetheless, uh, what, what, what will be the issues in the next elections uh, 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 when it comes I, uh, Would it be the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Would that be on the table? I'll tell you my point of view in two words. To my greatest sorrow, but it's true today to the United States, Henry Kissinger used to say about Israel that Israel has no foreign policy, only domestic policy. Today, sometimes it may look also for America. So I'm afraid that will be too much discussion all the time about the Iranian crisis, etc., etc., about conflict, but I think that what happened in the social protest, it's not about just cottage cheese, it's not about that young social worker, doctors, teachers are realizing that in 20 years they won't be able to afford apartment or sustainable income. The undercurrent that Israel, if it continues, and only advocate expanding of the defense budget over time who will break down the Israeli society, this issue will come in the election, and I'm sure other people will try to speak only on Iran. So therefore, we'll do everything in our utmost, in addition to the Iranian issue, and I have my point of view on Iran if you ask later, that we have to bring both the social issue and the partition of the Holy Land issue. Both have to come to the agenda. Do I the hear a duck in the room? <laughs> is there a duck? In, is that a <laughs> nuclear duck or a lame duck? <laughs> what duck is it? Uh, Amra Mitzna. Why is Netanyahu so... Uh, um, has this mosaic feeling towards Iran, or against Iran, rather? Uh, Netanyahu is not the first uh, right-wing leader that is using threats as a way to control and to gain the attraction of the people. Uh, Sharon did it in uh, 2003 elections when he beat with you. the Iraqis issues and frightened the people of Israel from non-conventional missiles that will come from Iraq to Israel. So Netanyahu, first of all, understand that he have to threaten and to make the people uh, afraid. And when the people are afraid, they don't look around on the main issues. And that's what he's doing. Secondly, by the way, uh, Netanyahu is the only leader from the right wing till now, the only prime minister that elected prime minister and didn't change his mind. <laughs> All the others, once they were sitting on the chair of the prime ministry, understood better what is the vital interest of the State of Israel. Maybe Netanyahu we, is the only one. Maybe we should send him to an optometrist. <laughs> we should send him away, and no matter where. As it's very difficult, Arad, to predict 18 months from now. Let's wait to see what will be the outcome of Kadima elections then the elections here in the United States. Then we didn't speak about Iran yet. Uh, attack or not attack. We were speaking oh, about ducks. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's very good, by the way. It's good <laughs> news not to speak only about Iran and the nuclear option. But 18 months is a lot of time. And still time to try our best in order to bring to the table the issue of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. We are sitting here with a, a, a cadre of very uh, moderate Israeli politicians. And uh, I want to ask you, is Iran a real threat on Israel? Is containing Iran an option? And if not, what? Avisha Braverman, I'll start with you. I'll be very clear. Clearly, Iran is a threat, and the Prime Minister put it forward. Of course, we have the military option. But I think there are many military strategies that oppose now for military action towards Iran. I want to add the economic strategic one. You see, the price of oil today is about 105, it was 103, 107. The world is in the greatest crisis that can turn into the Great Depression. Unemployment in Spain, unemployment in Greece is beyond 20%, and among the youth it's 50%. Europe is on the verge, if it's either the euro will split or not. If the price of oil will jump above 200, I think it will be tremendous chaos Unemployment, for me, even a threat of Great Depression, including a great damage to the economy of the world. Now, the question is, does sanction work or not? It depends. In Cuba, sanction did not, sanctions didn't work, economic sanctions, because of the fact that many countries evaded them. In South Africa, they did work. I salute President Obama at the European Union for the effective sanctions with the SWIFT that right now most of the monitored transactions of Iran are not around. You have to go back to barter or to the mafia way to take certain uh, suitcases with cash. Therefore, I oppose military action now in Iran also for this reason. Because the outcome of military action now can put the world in such economic chaos and the finger will be pointed toward Israel and maybe the Jews. So let's President Obama, let's the European Union do a job, and who should be for a while quiet. Gava. First of all, I must admit that I'm very concerned of the idea that Iran is going to have uh, nuclear weapons. And I heard uh, Mr. Netanyahu uh, say that uh, Iran is an Israeli problem. And I want to say that Iran is not, an, is not only an Israeli problem, it's the problem of the global world, first of all. <laughs> and um, you know, I heard uh, Mr. Netanyahu using such a cynical, uh, language uh, talking about the Holocaust in order to frighten the Israeli public of the idea that Iran might have nuclear weapons. And, and I know that the use of such cynical language meant to draw attention from our real problem. The only problem of us is the Palestinian problems. That's why using the issue of Iran, and I don't want to diminish the issue of Iran, and, uh, to, to, uh, to say that it's not a problem. It's really a problem. But our problem is to try to reach agreement with the Palestinians. And Mr. Netanyahu doesn't want to deal with the issue of the Palestinians. Ghalem Majadla, is uh, the Iran issue a pretext for Netanyahu not to deal with the Palestinians? Haim Ben-Met Benjamin Netanyahu mishtamesh baklaf ha-Irani ke-terutz כדי להסיח את הדעת מהסכסוך הישראלי-פלסטיני? זה נכון מאוד. It's very true. זה כמעט כל המערכת בישראל אומרת את זה. The whole Israeli system, almost all the Israeli system claims so. וזה בריחה מהנושא האמיתי בסדר יומנו, הנושא הפלסטיני. And this is escaping from the real issue 
which is the Palestinian issue. But it's only a temporary uh, uh, runaway because uh, it is not the remedy because the real issue is the Palestinian issue. Netanyahu actually harmed Israel when he uh, creates the image that Israel is leading the world and not being part of a world operation. We know the truth. The Iranian issue, the Iranian nuclear issue, is a threat to the whole region, to Saudi Arabia, and to the excess of peace. Iran lo zancha et hakamat haimberia haparset atika ala mifrats vaal Saudi kula v'gam ayom emurim amifrats haparset v'lo emurim amifrats haravi. Iran is still hoping to rebuild the old Persian empire all along the Persian Gulf. Thank you. Let me tell you a uh, personal story, I'm telling you too. A couple of years ago, my daughter, Shiraz is his name, fun, her name, funny <laughs> enough, she calls me and she asks me, Daddy, how many nuclear bombs do we have? <laughs> she was 12 then. You know, I, I swallowed my... Uh, whatever I had in my mouth, and I asked her, why are you asking that? So she said, the, the, the boys here, I'm sitting with the boys, and they say we have 200 nuclear bombs. Is that possible? So, you know, I'm a, an experienced journalist. I tell her, according to foreign sources, <laughs> indeed, we have 200 nuclear heads. And then she says, so, if we have 200 nuclear heads, why are we so worried that the Iranians might have won? <laughs> what, what, what would you have answered her? She is great. I think she is great, your daughter. Really, she's, she got a wonderful education. Yeah, she, she was brought she, up perfectly. Yeah. What I usually say, in, in that respect, I, uh, I used to quote uh, Pervez Musharraf, who is not the righteous among the nations, but still he was a, a, a president of uh, Pakistan and a very close ally for the United States for many years. And uh, it was in Davos in, in 2005, I think, he was asked in a news conference there, what about the war between you and India? And he said, and I'm, I'm quoting from memory, but he said, since we have the bomb and they have the bomb, it seems that war has become a bit out of fashion. <laughs> what about deterrence? Wasn't the world much well structured when we had the Iron Curtain during the Cold War. I, I, I'm not talking about the well-being of the human beings, but the structure of the world order. Wasn't it much better? Avishai? I'll tell you a story since you talk about your daughter. Well, you were talking about your mothers. <laughs> and my son, and my son, and my son. You see, I joined the World Bank in 76 under President McNamara. And when I left the bank, I was the only one when I was president, I brought, uh, he already retired, President McNamara to Israel. It was his only visit. We spent time in Beersheba. And he articulated very clearly in Beersheba because he was the architect of the idea that the people that right now, at that time, hold nuclear power will create a nuclear club that will be intact and won't allow other members to come in. Well, McNamara is not anymore with us. He was a very wise man. And I'll tell you, I'm not talking about Iran. But if I have to forecast 
Mr. Arad, and I know that economic forecasting makes astrology looks good. Uh, essentially, in 10 years, you'll see many countries in the world that may have nuclear arms. It can be Brazil, it can be others. The issue today for the world is not who have nuclear powers. Because with biological and chemical warfare, you can destroy the world. The issue is, can we raise our consciousness to understand that we are one on the planet? Because if we continue with the same philosophy, that we are different than the others, the consuming monkey and the killer monkey will kill itself. And that was my answer to McNamara. Okay. So, time is running very fast when you're having fun. So, uh, I had fun, I hope you did too. So, uh, thank you all for listening to us. Thank you for being with us. And uh, we call off this session. Thank you and uh, good luck with your very well done job. Thank you.